this is how humans see data. When you open up a web page, you look at text, you read the text, you understand the meaning, you see images, you look at them, you understand them. How does a computer see this? A computer sees the same thing this way. It's basically coding, uh, jargon, numbers, right? Integers, meaningless. There is no meaning. If we want the computer to become intelligent, we call it artificial intelligence. If we want the computer to become intelligent, we have to allow it to understand the data and the images the way we understand the data and the images. How do we get there? What is a computer? It's a calculator, uh, which we can give instructions and it executes them in a sequential way. This is the traditional view of a computer. It ex executes the instructions in a sequential way and it produces a result. So it's like me doing calculations on the calculator, but it does it very fast and uh, very quickly and without doing errors uh, because it can compute without making human mistakes. Okay, how can we get such a calculator to understand the meaning, of to become intelligent, to understand the meaning of the data? Let's consider a scenario where I'm speaking on a microphone, like right now. So my audio, which is, a, which is a sound wave, is getting inside of the mic. The mic is translating it into an electrical signal. The electrical signal is sent to, through wireless or wired communication to the computer system or to a processor, which is connected to the computer system. The processor samples the audio wave. Once we sample, in other words, we choose different choke points and we get some samples, we can translate these guys into numbers. And from here on, the computer handles things. So I went from an audio to a bunch of numbers. Remember, this is a calculator, so it only deals with numbers. Once I have the numbers, I can process the music. Same thing with text. When you type a certain word on the keyboard, it does not actually understand that it's a word. It understands it as a bunch of numbers. Every letter is a number. And then the concatenation of these numbers is the word. So for me, this is hello for the computer. It's 011000 for the H, and then something else for the E, and so forth. Right? So I'd like the computer to not process hello as a bunch of numbers, but to understand that hello is a greeting in English. I'm saying hello. So you should so say something back to you. Hello back, or something like that. So how can I get there? The most basic form of the data we call data. If we have meaning assigned to the data, we call it information. A lot of people confuse both, but they are not the same. For us experts in data processing, it's not the same. Information is when we assign meaning to the data. So this is a greeting in the English language. Metadata is data describing, or information describing the information. So who said this word? Where was it said? In what context? All of that we call metadata. Knowledge is the concatenation of everything, all the information and all the data put together regarding a certain piece of data. This is what we want the computer to understand. Whenever something is uttered out, textually, image, audio, we want the, we want the computer to understand the knowledge behind it. So how can we get there? Using different kinds of techniques which fall under artificial intelligence. A lot of people confuse artificial, we were having this chat with Alexia a couple of seconds ago. A lot of people confuse artificial intelligence with machine learning. It's not the same. Machine learning is a subcategory of AI. AI is more generic. And you will see we need different kinds of techniques to do different things. Let's start with knowledge representation. When I, I'm speaking with you in English, you understand my English because you know English. Maybe you learned English in high school, in middle school, maybe you are native speakers. You've learned the language. In other words, in your mind somewhere, there's a, some kind of a dictionary, a mental dictionary, which is there. Whenever I say a word, you connect it with your own understanding of that, that word. Just like looking into a Webster dictionary, whenever you find searching for a definition for a word, your mind is doing it automatically, and you relate to what I'm saying. If I were speaking in Japanese and you don't speak Japanese, you wouldn't understand what I'm saying because you don't have that dictionary. So we want some kind of a reference. We can communicate because we have some kind of a reference, a common reference, which is the English language. If I want to communicate with a computer using the English language, it should have the same reference of the English language that I have. 
So it should have some kind of a dictionary somewhere. And it should be able to process every word I'm saying, compare it with its own definitions in that dictionary, and connect the meaning so that it understands what I'm saying. OK? Now, the traditional vision, or the traditional, most of you here are my age or a little older. So we've all used paper-based dictionaries, OK, before the Wikipedia and the Encarta and the digital dictionaries. When I was in middle school, I used to, whenever my teacher used to tell me, okay, go look, look up the definition of that word in the dictionary. So I used to flip it, locate the word alphabetically ordered, and then I'd have the definition. With computers, we can do things much more interestingly. Instead of having the words ordered um, alphabetically, why don't we connect them following their meanings? We can create some kind of a graph-based dictionary. We call it a taxonomy or an ontology. Some kind of a graph where every, con every concept is a node and every concept has its definition. And instead of having them spread out alphabetically, I would connect them using their meanings. So now, when I say car to a computer system, it simply locates the word car in its graph-based dictionary. And by simply locating the concept car, it can connect it to all other concepts in the dictionary. So it can connect car to engine, it can connect car to wheels, it can connect car to driver by basically looking into that dictionary. So knowledge representation is the first challenge. How do I produce this dictionary? This is a challenge on its own, and it's a research area on its own. Now how to process, how to go through that graph-based dictionary and identify interesting meanings and make connections, this is another area which we call search algorithms. And that's also a subcategory of AI. How can I identify the shortest path between one concept and another concept so that I understand that some concepts are closely related to together whereas other concepts are not as close. Mammoth and African elephant are certainly closer to each other in terms of meaning, in terms of uh, what they describe versus Indian elephant and plant. Why? Because by navigating the, my graph structure, it takes me more time, more hops, to go from one concept to another. Here, we are talking about a different kind of processes, which we call search agents or search algorithms. Now, emotions. How do we translate that into emotions? The title of my talk was Understanding Human Emotions. For me, human emotions, for, I mean, when I try to teach a computer system to understand human emotions, it's nothing but data processing. So I, if I have a dictionary where I have some concepts describing the emotions with their connections with other concepts, whenever there's a certain word that is being mentioned by the user and whenever I want the computer to understand the feeling that is inferred through that word, I simply navigate my dictionary and identify, and I identify the closest feelings, the closest emotions. And that provides me with a score. Okay, the user now I'm getting married. Word married. Where does it lie in my dictionary? What does it connect to? And then I identify that married, for most people, could mean 70% joy, 30% sadness, 10% something else, right? I will get back to the context and how it affects things because married for someone who did not have a successful marriage could be something negative. And that depends on the context of the person. So that I'll discuss later. So here in that, in that um, regard, I'd like to show you a very quick demo of one of the projects that some of my master students did regarding text-based sentiment analysis. They applied it on Twitter. So they, f they thought, OK, a lot of people use Twitter to type messages. A lot of people uh, uh, post messages without actually understanding the emotions inferred through those messages. Sometimes the messages are violent, sometimes the messages are gross, sometimes the messages are too happy, too sad. So it would be nice for the engine itself to tell us, okay, careful, what you're typing now reflects 70% happiness, 30% sadness, 20% excitement. Is that what you want to express? If yes, keep it, otherwise revise it. It helps me fine tune the emotions that I want to reflect through my posts. And here, 
the user can choose the emotions that are of interest to her or to him, and then the system will automatically identify the sentiment scores through those posts. Why is that useful? Sentiment or social monitoring and social conditioning, sentiment conditioning, right? If we want to publish something that is acceptable by everyone, it has to be, it has to be, it has to infer what we want it to infer in terms of emotions. Okay, now, is it that simple? Of course not. What are some of the bigger challenges? First, ambiguity. When you uh, send some, when you communicate with a computer system and you type some words or you speak some words, uh, every word might have more than one meaning. Cricket, is it the game or is it the insects? All right. So this ambiguation, trying, allowing a computer system to understand the right meaning of the word uh, is a challenge. Another challenge is context. How do I identify the context of a certain word or a certain piece of data? Okay, the context could depend on the surrounding words, the discussion that is happening. It could depend on the person's profile. It could depend on the location where the person is saying the, the words. It could depend on the time, at night, during the day. It could depend on the situation, at lunch, at dinner, right? What about images? What if we go into multimedia? Images and videos, how do we, how can we infer emotions from these kinds of data? So if, if you look at that image, what does it reflect? Happiness? Most people would say happiness. Well, what about this image? Is it, does it still reflect happiness? I'm not, I'm sorry about the, if the projector is not showing the colors properly, but the colors are different here. But it seems that the guys are doing some kind of a similar gestures. But just because the colors are a little different, many people would think this is not as happy as the previous, it doesn't reflect as much happiness as the previous image. So why do, how, do we, how do we process emotions through images, for example? In, with, with multimedia data, uh, using dictionaries only, so knowledge representation only, or search graphs, uh, search algorithms only, is not enough. We need to go farther. And this is where we start using what we call machine learning. So what is machine learning? Machine learning is allowing, it's a bunch of techniques, which allow a computer to learn things without us programming it to do these things. So now it's not a calculator anymore where I provide it with the instructions and it executes these instructions. Now it's something uh, that takes some input, which are data, multimedia, for example, images, and then automatically identifies the instructions that it has to execute to recognize certain patterns. We're talking about pattern recognition. To recognize certain patterns or categorize or classify those data. So I can feed the computer a bunch of images and I tell it these images mean happiness and these images mean sadness and these images reflect fear. And after it learns these patterns, I provide it with a new image which it hasn't seen before. And it should be able, if it's intelligent enough, it should be able to tell me, okay, probably based on what I learned, this reflects a little bit of sadness and more happiness. And do you understand what I'm saying? It's like a child, you teach it. A machine learner is like a child. You feed it solution, problem, uh, sorry, problem, solution, problem, solution, problem, solution. And then you provide it with a new problem, which is similar to the others, but it's not exactly equivalent to the others. And you ask it to solve it. And it should be able to solve it on its own without me programming it because it learned on its own. Very simple example. Imagine I have a bunch of objects and I want to classify them. So I teach my learner, I tell the learner, okay, I want four, five categories. The first category means this. The second category means that. The third category means this. I'm teaching it. This is the teaching phase. I could teach it with one simple, one single object or a multitude of them, right? Here I showed one object per category to simplify. And then I ask it, okay, given these objects, categorize. Tell me where each and every object lies, in what category. This is a project we did with a religious museum in Lebanon where they had a lot of artifacts photographed and they wanted to categorize them automatically. Some artifacts, they didn't know their origins or the names. 
So we basically went with the pictures without necessarily having descriptions. And we categorized to help them put them in the museum. When we're talking machine learning, a lot of people think, I hope you've heard the term, I think you've heard the term, artificial neural networks, right? There are different kinds of techniques to do machine learning. The most famous are artificial neural networks. Why? Because they, we, they are based on the structure of the brain, the human brain, so we relate to them more. But there are other mathematical algorithms, mathematical procedures, which allow us to do machine learning. So how does it happen? If I want to go into a little more detail. If I have an input image, I, can, I need to first identify the different objects in the image. Then for every object, I run it through a learner, whatever the learner. Here I'm using an artificial neural network, but I could have used any other learner. The learner will identify each and every object with the objects that it learned before. And then it will produce a result and it will tell me, okay, this guy is a girl jumping, that guy is a guy running, a person, a, a male running. This background is a blue sky. This background is green grass. And it produces something, we, at the end we get something which looks like this. Labels corresponding to the visual uh, constituents of the image. And since we segmented and we know the locations, we will have the location. So I have a girl to the left of a boy, to the left of another guy, to the right of a girl, jumping, running, screaming, in the middle of a blue sky, on top of green grass. That would be the end result. This is how a computer sees the image. You see it, you understand it instantaneously. But a computer needs to do that processing to understand those meanings. right? We also developed a few projects with some of our students related to image processing, inferring sentiments or inferring meaning from these images, trying to group them together. If I want to organize, you, all of us take pictures with our cell phones. Imagine we have a solution which can categorize all the pictures automatically. Google is currently working on it or it currently is deploying something, Google Images or something for cell phones, for mobile applications, where it tries to categorize. If I want to organize my images, I need the computer to understand the meanings. Otherwise, it will do things based on color only, which is not, or based on shape only, or based on, text, based on visual features only, which is not very interesting. If I wanted to do things in terms of meaning, I, hate, I need to go through that process of allowing the computer to learn the meanings behind the images. To go into something more interesting in the last couple of minutes, it's not enough to represent knowledge. It's not enough to search in that knowledge. It's not enough to learn from what we see, but if we want a computer to be really intelligent, it has to be able to uh, think uh, on its own, identify its own objectives, seek those objectives, uh, take the initiative. This is how a child learns. It doesn't only see, but it actually manipulates, and it learns from its own experience. Do we have processes which allow us to do that computationally? Yes, we have. We actually uh, learned it from nature. Um, evolutionary computation or genetic algorithms. How does it work? Well, imagine my s the problem that I'm solving or the, the data is a giraffe and I want to produce the best giraffe possible, the best data possible. I start with a population of giraffes, genetically coded, and then I allow them to mate together. They have sex, which is an interesting thing computationally speaking. Then I uh, allow them to have some mutations, which happen more or less randomly. And then I test the quality of my giraffes. The giraffes which, are, which have a better quality, which can reach food easier, will survive. The others will die. The giraffe could be an image. The giraffe could be a text. The giraffe could be a solution to a problem. It could be anything you want it to be. As long as you're coding it, you apply the process, and you get what you want. One of our projects was music, sentiment-based composition. So the giraffe was a piece of music. We wanted to compose music which reflects sentiments. So we started with very, very small chunks of music and we started to allow them to mate and to mutate and we tested their quality in terms of the sentiments they express. And the music which highlights the sentiments that we want to express survived and the others, the other music, the other pieces died. And that's how we produced our music composer. 
Let me show you a quick demo about that. I'm going to play a piece of music, which is just to show you the difference between human music, human composition, and computer-based composition. So I'm going to play you a piece which was composed by the computer. So you can feel that it's clumsy. It's a little clumsy. Remember, the computer is composing. The player is human, but the computer is composing. The composition is synthetic. Now let's listen to a real piece so that you see the difference. This is a piece which was composed by a real composer. Flows more naturally expresses a little happiness, some sadness, some melancholy. The sentiments are clear, right? Actually, it's the other way around. This is a piece composed by our own synthetic composer, computer. And the other piece was composed by a human, modern composer, called Scriabin. So we are at a stage now where we can teach our computer system to compose music that expresses sentiments that we want to express. Right? And it composes correct music. And it expresses the sentiments that we want to express. Because every time it doesn't do a good job, we kill the composition. The bad giraffe, we kill it. And we keep the good ones. And after a certain while, it starts composing more or less perfectly. You can say perfectly, but it starts composing the way we want it to compose. To conclude, I'm going to go to applications. Why do we need to process sentiments and data? Uh, social media, first application. Whenever you're interacting with social media, a lot of people express their opinions. Their we need to provide these guys with some sentiment indicators so that they are careful when they're posting something, that they're posting what they want to post. That they want to reflect what they want to reflect. Because a lot of times we post and we don't know, we don't, we're not sure how it's going to be received by the others. Uh, customer reviews, of course. We're not going to go, we're not going to have hu humans read the customer reviews and analyze whether they're happy or sad manually. Let's have computers do that. Right? They will batch process a whole bunch of reviews and then tell us if the customer is happy about a certain car, a certain product, or sad, not happy with something else. M uh, population mood analysis. For example, in Lebanon, you don't, know to go, you don't need to go and do surveys to understand how the population is feeling. Just open social media up and analyze what they're posting. Right? And you'll see whether they're before elections, they may be excited. After the elections, they're sad. Uh, whenever something happens, people start posting something. Analyze those, and you can more or less identify how the population is feeling. Social monitoring. Uh, a lot of people, especially those who have difficulties expressing their emotions, like, for example, children with autism, they need solutions which help them condition or understand, relate to feelings better. Uh, educational tools, which allow them to express or relate to the feelings the way other people, normal people, uh, feel or express them. Of course, human-computer interaction. I'm working on my computer, and I'm typing very hard. The computer feels that I'm stressed. So maybe it should start playing some music to relax me automatically. I'm driving my car. My children are in the back, making a lot of noise. The car sees that I'm nervous because it's looking at my face. It's doing facial recognition, and it sees that I'm grimming a little bit. It should maybe play some music to calm my children down, because otherwise I'll be upset and I won't be driving carefully. Right? I arrive home. I slam the door. There's a shock sensor. It feels that I slammed the door. OK, maybe it should start playing my favorite movie. Right? To all of these guys require human-computer interaction, so feelings, analyzing emotions. Far future, 20, 30, 40, 100 years from now. I'm not talking in a couple of years. I'm talking in hundreds of years. Space exploration, deep space exploration. OK, you'd say, why are we talking about sentiment analysis for deep space exploration? If you're going to send astronauts to uh, outside, within the solar system or even outside of the solar system, they will be living together for months or years in a row in a tin can. The number one problem is psychology. How can we keep them from not killing each other? The ship has to be sentimentally or emotionally intelligent. 
It should feel when they are stressed and do something to relax them. It should feel when they are feeling anguish or anger and do something to remedy that. So show social conditioning on the spaceship. Okay, option number two. It's very complicated to send humans to do deep space exploration. Let's send embryos and hatch them when they arrive. Okay, logistically it's much easier. The ship will be smaller and then I won't have to deal with these psychological problems. If I hatch the embryos when they arrive, someone needs to teach them how to become human, how to be human. That something or someone will probably be a robot which understands feelings and emotions and can teach those feelings and emotions to the children. So I need to be able to design emotionally intelligent robots. Third option, let's not send embryos. And this is the most viable option that a lot of NASA experts are considering. The only people or the only entities who will be able to do deep space exploration will be robots. But since we are humans, we always like to present things in our image. This is, I think, where religion came from. In our background, we always like to, this is why we like our children, because we see them in our image. So we will be probably uh, enthusiastic if we can send robots which are in our image. And for these robots to be in our image, they have to be able to understand emotions and to express, they have to be sentient. Likewise, AI for human emotion processing is central in that aspect. So these are challenges, not on the short run, but on the, on the long run. I hope I didn't take a lot of time. At your disposal for any questions.